which are popping up around the world, which are kind of replicating what the Ndaba is doing. And uh, these, were, these summer schools were inspired by the Ndaba. So we have the summer school in Eastern Europe. This is in its second year of running. Um, we have the Southeast Asian Machine Learning Summer School, uh, which, took, which, which took place in Indonesia this year for the first time. And then Kipu, which is the South American version of the Indaba, and uh, it will be taking place in Uruguay in November. So it's really inspiring that uh, the Indaba as a community is inspiring other communities to do similar things and strengthen machine learning in their communities. And, and obviously to do that, we, we really thank our sponsors in being able to, to support us in, in our endeavor to build this community, but then also allow us to go on and, and inspire other communities. But the reason for today's session is for the uh, Kambule Doctoral and Masters Award Ceremony. So this is the second year that we are running the awards program. Um, last year we awarded two amazing prize winners, two really inspirational Africans um, working in, in research and, and in technology development. And so this year we're very excited to continue the program. Uh, we introduced a third award, which is the Kambule Masters Award. So I'll get into that today. Um, but just a bit of background. So Tamsanda Kambule was um, one of South Africa's best known mathematicians and teachers. And he is most known for his very influential work in, in education, specifically black education, under the Bantu Education Act in apartheid South Africa. And so it is because of him, because of his his work, um, we, we named these awards. And uh, we, we established two, two Kambule Awards. The doctoral award is to award doctoral candidates at African universities who have demonstrated excellence in research and writing in their doctoral work. And then the master's award is for, for the equivalent master's, uh, their master's dissertations. And so today's, today's ceremony is to recognize the winners of the 2019 awards. Um, for each award, we, 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 we recognized an honorable mention as well as a winner. Um, and so for the Kambule Doctoral Award, our honorable mention was Stephanie Muller for her thesis in genome-wide associations between human G-types and mycobacterium tuberculosis and clades during causing disease. So she's not here, I don't think, today, but we can give her a round of applause. And then our Kambule doctoral winner is Marcel Atem King from Rhodes University. So he is, uh, so each of the winners today will give us a, a, a talk of their research. Let's actually give him a round of applause before I begin. So Marcel did his undergrad in maths in Cameroon and also in Cameroon his honors and masters in computer science. Um, he then joined the Center for Radio Astronomy Techniques and Technologies in 2013 to pursue his PhD in Applied Maths with a specialization in big data and data science for array signal processing. He, uh, after completing his PhD, he then went on to do a postdoc at the SKA, Square Kilometer Array in South Africa, and he's now a lecturer at Rhodes, and uh, he is developing and teaching the machine learning curriculum there. Uh, so the thesis for which he won the award, uh, is in his thesis he developed no novel algorithms and techniques for significantly reducing data volumes produced by these radio interferometer arrays like Meerkat and SKA. So we'll hear a little bit about his work. So thank you and welcome Marcel. Actually I have a trophy and a certificate. So I would like to use this opportunity to thank um, the Indaba organizer and Indaba founder for this uh, award. And I, I mean, I was not expecting this, but I'm really, really humbled to receive this prestigious award. So the, this recognition should not be 
mine alone, but also to those who contributed, particularly those of my supervisors, PhD supervisors, who contributed a lot to make this happen, happen today. So before I start with the presentation, I would like to introduce you to the concept of radio interferometry. So I will use a very simple two-element interferometer to describe where, how we record the data and how we process the data and how we save the data for you to understand what the, 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 the objective of my work and the interest. So, next. I got it, thank you. Hmm? The green button, okay. Cool, so uh, I'll be talking today about uh, data compression and field of interest shaping and fast algorithm to, for position dependent deconvolution in radio interferometry. So for a two, no, it seems like it's not working. Okay. Yeah, coming for if a two-element radio interferometer, if you have two ground-based radio telescopes, then you are looking, you want to observe something in the sky, I'll call that T, L, and M. L and M are the position of the object that you are looking for. So basically, these two element in radio interferometer, they are separated by a distance that I'll call here a baseline. And the baseline is projected across three directions, three vectors, the east-west, south-west, and a vector that we point to the object that you are trying to measure. So basically, the interferometer will measure the Fourier transform, the Fourier component of what you are looking for, as you can see the formula. So basically, a radio telescope measures the Fourier transform of the sky. So what we have is called the visibilities. Okay? It's a complex number. So basically, this theory comes from basic signal processing techniques that you know, in signal processing, a well-behaved signal can be decomposed into a sine, cos a, a sine cosine function. And to reconstruct back the signal, you must just sum all the different sine components of the signal. So if you look at the different sine components, all they have different amplitude, different beating, and different resolution. So basically, a radio interferometer is a set of two element radio interferometers, as you saw previously. Each each two element radio interferometer is we produce one of the sine wave that you are seeing. So for very long interferometer, you have a very high resolution um, sign. Very short um, interferometer, you have very low resolution sign signal. So basically, the interferometer we try to sample a space called visibility space. So in the beginning, this space is quite empty, but as times go. Radio, uh, radio inter um, astronomers, they use the Earth rotation to synthesize this. So at each time step and at, at each frequency step, they will try to record a measurement. And each of these measurements is one of the sine waves you saw previously. So basically, yeah, so this is how our data is saved into computer memory. So you have a set of source that you are looking for. You have the spectrum window, the bands across for which you are measuring these the sources and you have different scan. So each of this, each of this year, you know, is a very three-dimensional tensor, baseline, time, and frequency. And each point here is a two by two complex matrix, right? So currently in South Africa, I mean, the astronomers are building the world's most sensitive radio interferometer called SK. So if you look at this, if you look at this, the prediction says that with the SK, the SK we have about 1,000 antennas. So with the SK, just for during 0 0.1 second, 0 0.1 megahertz, you know, we will record a data one, an approximate of 142 terabytes. And if an observation have to go during two years and have to scan for about 14 gigahertz, you can imagine we are already at the regime of big data. Even the world's most supercomputer won't be able to process this data. 
So basically, my work was to find techniques, how to compress this data and keep the information that the astronomer they want, and try also to clean up the data. Basically, that was my work. So, yeah. So the Fourier space that I show you, if you want to look for just for two radio interferometer, two baseline, a very short baseline, long baseline, you see that, in a way, the space is irregularly sampled, as you can see. For short baseline, you have the data points are very close to get, are very close, and for long baseline, you know, you have very uh, low sample rate. And if you move forward, basically, the, uh, uh, astronomer, how they do to compress this data? They just do averaging, very simple average that you know. Basically, they just take all the data, they put them together, of the average to one. So that is how they compress the data. Basically, in my work, anyway, so by doing averaging, you know, something that they call the correlation would happen. Basically, it's smearing. If you want to look at this in terms of image processing, it's smearing. They will smear the object that they are looking for. So if you look at this for different compression rate, you know, the signal is smear. So basically, my work was to do something like this, but keep the signal amplitude constant without smearing, right? So basically, if you really want to look at this, we want that if an astronomer say he wants to observe a field like this, so he will be pointing here. Basically, if he said, okay, I want everything in here, and then anything out there is something that I don't want. Basically, what I want, I want to keep everything here, what they want, and suppress everything out. So basically, it's not only compression, it's only also suppression, right? So if I move forward, if I move forward, basically in the beginning, I try to show that averaging is equivalent to convolution, what they are doing. So if they have this signal, they try to average this into three samples, basically I said, okay, you can also take the same signal, find some weighting scheme, and do um, convolution, and then pulling, right? So basically pulling, I call this basically sampling because it's not like max pulling or just you sample the signal at the center of the, the, the sampling interval that they want. So basically the first comp contribution of my work was to show this and show that and try to define this distribution function. So a function that we try to understand how the instrument works and how the observation is working, how the noise is behaving, and understand all those type of distribution and be able to synthesize a weighting scheme for all these things. And then I use that for compression. That was the... So, I mean, I won't go into this, but after, if you want to understand how I did this, you can see me after for this. So basically, I'll just go to the result. So if you look at this, for 33.8% data compression with normal averaging, what they used before, you have something like this, the gray line. But they want to observe a field large as this. You see how they attenuate everything out there. They are not able to do what they want, right? With what we came out with, you see that anyway, we can keep what they want, and everything out there is what they don't want, and we try to suppress them. So basically, that, that is what we did. So then we said, okay, for someone who, who is not using some, something like what we are doing, who just wants something like a taper, maybe a, some Gaussian function, a sing function, he just used that to, for like a, his convolution window. We have something like this. You are still killing up your signal. So we also show that, well, we can, they can also at some point say, our instrument can observe just a field across two degrees, but we want to go across a field of four degrees. So we are able to manage that. So that was basically the first contribution. So, but this comes with a lot of complication also because, you know, you saw um, convolution and, you know, someone who is doing averaging is actually gaining his sensitivity. You know, he's actually killing the noise, but when you are doing all this uh, tapering and all this stuff, you are actually amplifying your noise. So basically, we said, okay, how can we try to do, as in signal processing, a regular sampling scheme? for radio astronomer than the irregular sampling scheme. Because imagine what we are doing there, the, the convolution window is different across all the visibility, all the data. For a true convolution, the window is 
the same everywhere. So it is not really a true convolution. It's something like a pseudo convolution. How can we do a true convolution? So if we want to do a true convolution, then we will do a regular sample. We do regular sampling, right? So to do that, we try to, dis to understand again the data, as you see here, for different baseline, three baseline only. If you want to do regular sampling, you will realize that for some short baseline, you will be doing a lot of compression, and for the long baseline, you will, do, you will be doing few compression, which is also cool because um, basically the noise come out, the noise, the long baseline are very sensitive to the noise than the short baseline. So anyway, if I'm able to use my filter, compress more data on the short baseline and just compress very little on the long baseline and leave, you know, try to suppress the noise, then I'll be doing better than the previous uh, method. Okay? But this came with this type of complication. We arrived with this type of tensor, you know, sparse tensor. The, dat the database astronomer they use don't understand this type of uh, tensor. How can we do to manage to implement something like this for them? Because if you try to say, okay, well, we came out with this idea, we, we are going to change completely your database. Definitely you have problem with them. And I'm very sure that you have a lot of problem and a lot of haters for this because they don't, they don't want to use this because basically you are trying to tell them that, well, because I will change your database, then you have to rewrite all your software that are based on this database, right? And you have to also learn to use my database. So if you want to understand how we did this, we can chat about that later, I won't go through. But basically, you know, if you want to understand very well what is happening there, we said, okay, on the long baseline, on the long baseline, we can now use our, our probability distribution function to generate all the weight. We do the convolution and pull in everything. But on the short baseline, if you, you can look, you can, on the long baseline, if you can see here, the, we have less, okay, we have less weighting scheme there, you know, so we are doing better in noise suppression. So if we go forward, okay, that's the result. We can chat about this later. Yeah. The third contribution was when we are doing all this filtering, all this stuff, but we remember that we are also doing a sort of um, 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 distortion in the image domain. So basically in the image domain, you see all this type of filter that we are doing in the frequency space. So we try to see, to try, we try to do the opposite of what we are doing, we were doing in the frequency space, which is deconvolution. We try now to remove all the filter from on the image that we did in the visibility space, which is the convolution. But this comes with a very big complication because we realize that all the sources are distorted. So basically, if you want to do convolution, you have, you have to evaluate the sampling function everywhere before you are. So you have to evaluate this function, which is computationally very, very expensive to do this. So we came out with this way like, OK, we won't just evaluate all this function, but we will use approximation theory to do the approximation. So we just define a function like this, that we integrate all the distortion and everything, and then from this function, we, just, we, we generate all the different filter in the, in, the, in the image plane, then we use that to do the, the deconvolution, right? Yeah. So I think that's the end. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Kossi. Okay, good. Pure more thank you. My question is, now that you've finished your PhD, what advice would you give to future PhD students to help them on their journey? Um, it is true that uh, doing a PhD is not a very simple part. I would advise them to perseverance. You know, they should just work hard and they should keep in mind that there will be a lot of things happening in the, in, in the, during their PhD. They should, they should just, they should not um, give up, 
You should just continue to do it, study, and yeah, at the end, at least there's something. So you have the fold from, from that. Yeah, at the end, there's something, basically. Yeah, because at the end of the PhD, you realize that anyway, you become now, even your supervisor, the person who supervises the work, you realize that at some point, you really understand it very, very deeply. So uh, it means that you become the expert now on what you were doing. Yeah. Great, so you, you, let's give him another round of applause. All right, so um, we now move on to the Kambule Masters Award. So the honourable mention for this award was awarded to Mkla Mkla Mvubu, and uh, he's affiliated with Stellenbosch University, but also Ames, uh, which I didn't, didn't put here, for his thesis in an error correction neural network for stock market prediction. Uh, so let's give him a round of applause in his absence. And then the Kambule Masters winner is awarded to Hisham Hamushi. Uh, so let's give him a round of applause while he comes up. So Hisham was born in Morocco and he did his master's in big data analytics and smart systems at Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University in, in Morocco. Um, and his thesis, which is the thesis that won this award, was for a lip reading system for laryngectomized people using deep learning specifically in resource-constrained uh, environments or systems, which he'll speak about today. Um, he's now a PhD candidate at the International University of Rabat, and he's working with NATO on the NATO Threat Prediction Project to model and forecast future cyber, cyber threats and attacks. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Deepler Indaba. I'm delighted to be here for my first time at Indaba. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to be uh, the recipient of this uh, prestigious uh, award. So uh, today I'm going to talk about my work uh, th throughout my master's. I'm going to talk about uh, lip reading, the system that we built to uh, attack uh, or to address the uh, as an application to uh, large large to uh, people, uh, and I will be talking on the, the the scheme that we thought about using deep learning and combined with hand moments to reduce uh, the dimensionality and to uh, do the recognition. So uh, the title of my uh, presentation is Lip Reading via Hand Convolutional Neural Networks Application to Laryngectomized People. So uh, what is uh, lip, lip Reading? Lip Reading is a visual speech recognition uh, is about, and is about understanding what a person is saying uh, by looking at the lips movement. And it is an intersection between computer vision and natural language processing to uh, process the, the images and to... Uh, 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 process only the, the uh, also the speech units. So uh, it, it is uh, a hot topic and an open problem that uh, requires to build uh, requires a mobilization to build uh, representative data sets that can uh, uh, can uh, reflect the real uh, situations and real uh, uh, the real world. So it is a, a dream be, uh, that's becoming to to come true. Uh, via the with the the deep learning uh, revolution. So when we look at the speech modalities of human communication, the, the lip reading is the video is the 
the mapping between video and text, where we uh, uh, transform the video, the speech in the video, to the text using uh, the, the, the required techniques. So uh, why we should build AI systems, uh, liberating AI systems? They have uh, many applications, and uh, liberating can uh, potentially enable uh, several new ones. And for, for example, uh, the, for the autonomous cars to interact with the car, to dictate messages in other environments, and more importantly, for, uh, in the case of large optimized people, where uh, the laryngectomy is when a patient is uh, diagnosed with a larynx cancer, then the, the medical interventions required to uh, an ablation of the larynx, then the, the person cannot reproduce the speech. Then a system like this can come to uh, rep can, uh, recognize the speech and uh, transform it to the audio. So uh, obviously, uh, there have been, uh, there have been uh, many attempts to address this problem, mainly at Oxford, uh, DeepMind, and the Imperial College, where we, they uh, uh, proposed uh, the several data sets and attacked using uh, adequate models, deep learning models. However, uh, th this problem is uh, just uh, addressed from a, sim a single uh, uh, point, uh, viewpoint where uh, we, we don't have yet uh, the representative data sets that can uh, uh, to, uh, allow us to tell that this, uh, this is a robust model that can uh, be generalizable on the speech independently of the context or the, the language. So uh, when we talk about deep, le deep learning, that it is uh, for in the, case, in the case when we deal with images, uh, we, we have to, 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 to talk about the depth. So we have to go deeper and build deep architectures, especially in the, for the high dimensionality data, such as the videos. And here comes the problem, especially in the African context. So uh, we have to wait for so long to the model to train. And especially when we, we don't have a GPU. So we, we have to, to, to to get a, a GPU and a bigger one to, uh, to do the, the, the training. Uh, another option is to stay shallow. However, uh, stay shallow uh, the, the does not, uh, generally does not guarantee uh, a satisfactory performance, especially in the high dimensionality uh, data. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, from this we thought about how can, uh, why we can, uh, what if we can uh, hit two birds with one stone? which means that we can work on the high dimensionality data uh, uh, with the shallow architecture, deep uh, convolutional architecture, and also uh, to uh, achieve a satisfactory performance. This is uh, where we, thought we, are, we combine high moments to reduce the dimensionality while retaining the useful and pertinent information in the image uh, without redundancy and combined with uh, the convolent. So in, in our uh, architecture, after processing the videos, uh, extracting the frames, uh, do the pre-processing, tracking the face and lips, uh, identifying the region of interest, which is the, major, the region of mouth, then we uh, apply the hand moment filter to extract the, the reduced representation of the data. Then we feed the, this re uh, reduced representation to the convolutional network which is a shallow uh, architect architecture in comparison to the bigger uh, architectures. So uh, what are these Han moments or Han uh, 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 representation? The Han moments are uh, based on the polynomials, Han polynomials uh, that are described in this uh, formula. And in, in this, in this uh, figure, we have uh, uh, Han polynomials up to order 12 for uh, 100, uh, for the size of 100, which is the size of one dimension, uh, one dimension of the image. And when uh, we, we, after uh, defining the polynomials, we apply the polynomials or uh, multiply the polynomials with the, the image to get the reduced representation 
uh, to get the, the moments via this, uh, uh, this formula. And another interesting uh, property of these moments is to get a reconstruction or to, to reverse the process is to reconstruct the image after uh, calculating the, the moment. So, uh, for example, here uh, we have original image of 80 times 60. We can rep, uh, reconstruct an image that is uh, nearly similar to the original one of order uh, 32, which is uh, nearly the half of the, the size of the original image. So uh, to assess our, uh, our method and our approach, we have used three data sets. The first one is AV letters, consisting of videos uttering uh, alphabets. The second one uh, consisting of uh, all OVS, consisting of the digit sequences uh, of uh, peers, uh, speakers uttering uh, digit sequences, 10 digit sequences. And the third one is Oxford BBC Leopardin in the Will, consisting of 500 word unique words uh, uttered by uh, different speakers. And now comes the interesting part. And the, the results, we, uh, we achieve the state of the art results on the two data sets of villagers and all of VS digits, uh, all of, uh, with the, an improvement of over a significant uh, improvement over uh, using only the shallow CNN without the hand convolute, the hand uh, uh, component. Uh, however, uh, the hash CNN uh, does not, that is less performing on the BBC lip reading in the wheel with uh, 58% uh, top one accuracy in comparison to uh, prior work. So to sum up, lip reading is as the, the intersection between computer vision and natural language processing has a growing uh, uh, importance in many fields, especially in the medical and uh, in the, for the autonomous cars. In this work, we have succeeded to uh, design a shallow yet efficient uh, architecture that can handle this problem. And we uh, achieved a SOTA, a SOTA results with limited hardware resources which is the case, uh, generally the case in Africa. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Fantastic. So Marcel and Hisham will be available throughout the week. So if you want to discuss more about their research, more technical details that I'm sure they couldn't get into in this short presentation, then, um, then, then find them. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to talk more. All right. So we now uh, come to the first keynote of, um, of today's session.